Welcome to the Rugby Tipsters Six Nations preview. Looking ahead to round five of the championship with none other than uh, John Callard, the former England player and coach, giving us his insight into how he thinks this weekend's games will fare. There's no doubt what the big game is this weekend. It is, of course, in Paris, where France, bidding for their first title since 2010, take on Wales, who are seeking a second Grand Slam in three years. Should be a monumental way to finish off the championship. It's a tea time, sorry, an early evening kickoff, eight o'clock at the Stade de France. It follows on from Scotland versus Italy and Ireland versus England. But uh, no guesses where we're going to start off at the Stade de France for the big one. JC, how do you see that one going? Well, France will be disappointed with their, not their performance, but the result against England. And let's say, what a magnificent game of rugby. No yellow cards, no red cards, no talking points. One TMO intervention, which was the right intervention, by the way. Brilliant, 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 brilliant for rugby. Great advert for rugby. So I think they'll be disappointed after that, even though they'd be delighted that they participated in such a game. Um, I think they will probably want to finish this section of games because I know they've got to play Scotland with a chance to win possibly the title. Wales, well they've done everything right so far. Yes they've ridden their luck and they've had a few things go their way but when you look at the stats with Wales and this is very very interesting with their stats, when you look at the amount of passes per point i.e the total number of passes equated or divided by the number of points they score, they're averaging averaging four passes per point. Now that suggests to me that they're clinical with ball in hand. France are only one pass behind them. They're five passes per point. So equally adept with ball in hand and being clinical when the opportunity shows itself. So getting the ball in the right areas could be key to determining what promises to be a great game. Absolutely, and I think France will look back on the England game and think their, pen, their bench sorry, their bench did not have the impact that it should have had against England. Wales's bench has always come on and made the difference. So it will be interesting in the latter stages of the game where you talk about when they've got possession and they've got territory, who will gain the upper hand by the impact of the benches. Now, of the two teams, who have you been impressed with the most in terms of the individual players? Obviously, Antoine Dupont has got a couple of tries and a lot more assists. Uh, he's one standout player. But who from the two teams are you looking to really step up and put the hand up and, and be the person that uh, delivers that title? Uh, Dupont, obviously, you mentioned, has been superb. Probably one of the, the best scrum half in the world at the moment. I know other people have their say about that. From a Welsh point of view, you can't look no further than Alan Wynne jones what a monumental athlete that stands in the middle of all those Welsh players and guides them and tells them what to do. And you just see little clips that are snipped out on Instagram or Facebook or whatever platform you want. Not just his leadership on the field, but there was a clip after winning the Triple Crown, I think it was, uh, against Wales. And that there he is helping the groundsman clean up. You know, he is not a person that just is satisfied by, yeah, I'm captain. He leads by example. So I've been very, very impressed with him. And the other one you've got to say that will light up a game if he's given half a yard is Reece Amit. Reece Amit's been a revelation this tournament. He's taken his tries well. He's not only taken his tries well, but he's linked to great tries. And that's why I think Wales have been so clinical with ball in hand. Yeah, let's not forget he had one short off at the weekend as well as scoring one. So he could have been the leading try scorer in the championship. Instead, he, I think he's tied at the top. Um, you talked earlier about being clinical and just looking at the overall scheme of things, Wales are very clinical when it comes to converting these Grand Slam deciding matches. Uh, four times out of four in the Six Nations era, they've won the game that matters to uh, produce the clean sweep. And 12 times out of 15 in the entire history of the championship. So they're certainly not bottle merchants, are they? No, far from it. Far from it at all. And I'll just give another stat here, if I can, out there for people who might be interested to say well, Wales can win this game. When Wales have won a penalty, okay, won a penalty and elected to kick that penalty a goal, their success rate is nine from nine. They're running at 100%. That's a deadly weapon when you're penalising sides. France, though, when they've won a penalty and elected to kick a goal, 
are only running at 66%, four out of six. So if you're a Welsh person or supporting Wales, you might be thinking, hey, yep, there's another advantage in our favour of winning what this would be there, what, fifth Grand Slam in, in, in this era? Yeah, in the Six Nations since 2000. And yeah, on the goal kicking point of view, normally if you've got a kicker of the quality of Dan Bigger, you'd be pretty happy. But they've not only got Dan Bigger, uh, I know Lee Halfpenny hasn't been playing, but obviously they've got him up their sleeves should they ever need him. And Callum Sheedy, whenever he's been called upon to take yeah. the kicks at goal, he's really stood up to the plate as well. So there's no real worries, is there? If, say, like Bigger picks up a knock or is having an off game and is taken off, you're, you're almost substituting like for like at the moment. Absolutely. And, and that's where we go back to the impact of the bench. Wayne Pavick has got full confidence with the bench. I, I think it was the, the England game that he made that bigger Sheedy substitution just after half time. Um, no apparent reasons, but he made that decision. And there we are. It's sink or swim for Callum. And Callum, well, he certainly swam and he swam fast. Well, we're talking up Wales a lot. So that indicates, I think, we both feel that the odds against them are pretty favourable. Uh, the bookies make France favourites for this game by around about a converted try. It's sort of six, seven points as we speak. And I think, personally, that that may be too many and Wales could even go on and win the game, let alone beat the handicap. What do you think? I totally agree with you. Uh, I totally agree. Some of these games are so close uh, on paper that they can go either way. I think that the, the Wales' favour, sorry, Wales' favour is that they've been so clinical with ball in hand. I think they've scored 17 tries in this tournament so far. And I think if the, if the French, like they were last week, were slightly loose in their game, where they're trying to run it from some ridiculous positions, it was great entertainment, but they put themselves under enormous pressure. I think one of the best sides in the championship of capitalising and seizing the opportunity is Wales. And that's why there's part of me thinking they could, they could claim this, this Grand Slam. The Wales, they've got the clinical edge, they've got the clinical finishing, they've got the goal kicking, they've got Alan Wynn's leadership, they've got the know-how of getting over the line. So really, um, yeah, it could be a very happy Saturday evening for those Welsh fans back home. As for the other games, let's uh, not forget there's two other games. <laughs> uh, and I think we're looking at at least one more away win, aren't we? Um, England, you fancy them to win in Dublin, don't you? Yes, and I thought they were back to their bench, uh, back to their best last week. And I mean their best because the bench had an impact. And I know I'm going on about this, but the bench came on, tightened the game up. Their driving play was Elliot Daly, who got dropped the week before, came back on. He had a massive intervention with that break that put pressure on, on the French in their 22. So the bench had a big impact. But I also would like to, to, to call out Atoji, Marrow. Marrow came in for a lot of stick because of his penalties and his discipline and all that business. He reined that all in last week. He was monumental in his game, stealing line-out balls, getting around the park, and then obviously scoring the crucial try to win the game. But I, I'm giving credit to the selectors for, for selection there because they brought in Charlie Ewells to take some pressure off Atoji, or that's what it seemed to me anyway, because Yules is a line-out expert, a line-out guru in the Steve Borthwick mould that can disassemble and assemble a line-out, and he broke that down. And I think that freed up Atoji to play his natural game. So yeah, credit to England where they were against uh, France, but they've got to go to Ireland. Now, if we can just talk a bit about Ireland at the moment, Ireland are the second highest passes to points so the number of passes that they're creating to score points and they're running at an average of 10 now for me to give England hope with that if that's happening in front of me of England hope is that all that passing is going on and some of those are redundant passes small little passes that they don't need to that's going to be food and drink to the English defence because that's what they thrive on Curry the Vinnie Bowlers uh, Sinclair George Cowan Dickey they like to smash those isolated runners. So if, if, if Ireland want to go and move the ball around without purpose, then I think that would be food and drink to, uh, to England. Yeah, from memory, watching that Scotland game, James Lowe and Keith Earls, whenever they got the ball, it seemed to be in a very narrow channel with very little space and they were easily snuffed out or almost pushed into touch. So, uh, yeah, you'd, you'd back England's defence, wouldn't you, to... Um, defend well against such a structured team like Ireland. It's, it's really the teams that 
produce a little bit of magic or something out of the box that worry England? Uh, yes, and I think Keenan has been very impressive for Ireland in his counter-attacking and his ability to get in the game. I think there's two other areas that we should mention, the Ireland-England game, that could sway it either way. It's well documented what's happening with the Ireland line-out and how they're disrupting the opposition. Six turnovers they got from Scotland's line-outs last week. Six out of eight turnovers. Four of those were steals, getting that man to pinch in the ball. England haven't been too bad themselves. They're averaging a steal a game. You know, Toji in particular has the, the clinical ability to pinch and line out ball. So there's a clinical area there that could sway the game. The other thing that I think that England could sway it, but, but, it's a big but, because Ireland's kicking game, when they kick to contest, i.e. when they kick to retrieve back that ball, is superb. We saw that against Scotland a number of times that Ireland, Sexton in particular, were putting up high balls and Earls and like were winning them back and then, then they were playing against an unstructured defence. So England will need to tighten up that. But if their kicking game is not spot on, like you've just talked about individuals having an influence and doing something special, then I look no further than Watson and May. Last week on the counter-attack, they were terrific. Watson and May, uh, Watson and May made two brilliant breaks, and I think that could be the difference for an England win rather than an Ireland win. Yeah, Watson uh, capped his fiftieth uh, cap with a fine performance, man of the match at Twickenham. Uh, and one other player that doesn't tend to get mentioned that much. He's a bit of a marmite uh, player, considering he's won over a hundred caps. But Ben Youngs, I thought he he did some very good things against Wales, even. Uh, and again, had another good game against France. And I think he's been a little bit sort of treated unfairly by uh, people out there online uh, in terms of the impact that he's had on this England revival as such. Uh, you mean by, bar by Marmite, either people love him or they love yeah, him. Yeah, That's yeah. what you mean. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, 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 I've been impressed with Ben. I've been impressed with Ben, sorry. Impressed with Ben. Because it does hurt when you're getting knocked back and it's out there in the media and all this business to come back and perform like the way he has and shown true leadership in, in, in his game and his game management. I'm really, really pleased for him. And I think, you know, he's got a big part to play on the weekend because I think he might get a little bit spicy. Let's be fair, England, Ireland, it might get a bit spicy, even though we love each other off the field, it might get a bit spicy of it on the field. And I think he'll be a guy that could just be a calming head around him, in front of him and what's on, what's on outside him as well. And we conclude with the opening game of the weekend, which is at Murrayfield, Scotland versus Italy. Pretty much every year, this is the wooden spoon decider, isn't it? Um, <laughs> May not be the case this year. We don't know what's going to happen between Scotland and France, but uh, I think uh, Italy uh, are pretty consigned to their fate now, aren't they? Uh, with that horrendous long losing run in the Championship continuing against Wales, and they just seem to be getting worse, if anything, don't they? John, John, you're right. And I had full of optimism at the beginning of the Championship because I saw glimpses of the way they wanted to play. Now four games in, and believe it or not, and I think a few people will be watching and listening to this, won't believe this stat. They have the highest number of passes in all the games. Okay, so they've created 692 passes in a total of four games. But their passes to point return is 18 passes per point. Now that has been the same right from game one to where it is now. And the coaching has not changed. And that signs to me is that you can't go doing the same thing and expect a different result. You saw it on the weekend. They had lots of possession against Wales. They were putting themselves into good positions. And I've mentioned it before, so sorry I'm sounding like a broken record here, is that they pass so deep back, he's finding it hard to get through the gain line. And then you either sh shuffle them into touch or they're passed into touch and it breaks down or they get isolated in those wide channels and you can't win the ball back. Something fundamentally has got to change with Italy and the way they play because they are a passionate nation. We want them in the Six Nations, but something has to change in order for them to be more competitive. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was watching it thinking, this reminds me of playing schoolboy rugby in Bath because the alignment was at 45 degrees. And you know, back in the 80s, uh, it used to uh, 
you know, like uh, bend the hip and uh, put your hands through in an exaggerated follow through. And uh, like you say, the ball would go back in a sort of diagonal. And it, and it was almost uh, reminiscent of that. Andy Robinson wasn't your teacher in Bath at the time, was he? Uh, no, he joined just after I left. But John Palmer, the Bath Centre was. Oh, John Palmer, legend. Legend yeah. John Palmer. Yeah, yeah. Taught by the best. Didn't do me any good, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. The, the, like you say, um, it's passing for passing sake, isn't it? Yeah, and, you know, and as we've proven already by talking about it, is that having the number of passes, having the number of possession or amount of possession doesn't mean you're going to win the game. As you, as you look at the stats there, the most clinical teams with the less passes per points is France and Wales. I'm not surprised. I'm yeah, not surprised. Yeah. We, we know coaches are only human. You've, you've been one, and you still are, obviously. Yeah. But uh, you've been in the cut and thrust of club rugby at Bath and Leeds. And the sight of Franco Smith with his head in his hands after 10 minutes, um, that just summed it up, didn't it? Yeah, and something I was taught from an, a younger age in my coaching, and I'm still learning coaching, don't get me wrong. I remember Graham Henry say, when you're coaching, if you don't learn each day, you might as well retire. You, 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 you keep on learning every day. And I was always told from an early day, is never show your expressions. It's a sign of weakness, and also it's not the right pressure, impression for the players. Uh, so, you know, you've got to learn to keep a poker face, whether it's good or bad. Well, like I say, he's only human, and I think that Italian team would drive most people nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we haven't run through the uh, predictions, uh, other than suggesting that we believe Wales and England will win, and obviously uh, you're going for Scotland over Italy. But um, mm. in Paris, how close do you think it will be? One score, either way, and I think it'll be five points or less. I've got a feeling for Wales. My heart says Wales, but you, you think your mind, when you look at it, France, they'll want to bounce back. Sean Edwards in particular will want to put something over on the Welsh. And uh, uh, that would be a big motivating factor. But at one score, less than five points either way. And the England-Ireland game? I'm going to go for an England win away from home. I think that just that if Ireland, as we talked about, try and move the ball without purpose, I think they'll be food and drink to, to, to England. And I think they'll be buoyed by last week and they'll want to bounce back. There's a lot on that game, by the way. There's a lot at stake because, you know, both teams will want to end their championship on a high and want to be up the table. Whoever loses will be down the table a little bit and it won't sit pretty. England by six to ten then? Yeah, maybe closer than that, but, but um, a, a good score, I think. Either a converted try or two penalties. And then Scotland, Italy, uh, are we looking at a cricket score again? Sadly, yes, sadly. But, you know, we don't know what selection will be. Scotland got a few injuries. That may give the opportunity to, some, to, blood, uh, to blood some new players. Um, I can't see it being anything other than 40, 40 points plus that Scotland will score. Now, Italy, they might make some line breaks and finish it off. But I'm expecting, you know, five or six converted tries from Scotland. So we're looking at 31 to 35 points as the bracket, potentially. Yeah. Great. Well, just like to say thank you, JC, for spending the time throughout the championship, yeah. uh, giving us your insight and uh, really enjoyed it. And, uh, well, fingers crossed we have another cracking weekend of rugby. Cheers, John. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Cheers.